Now we're going to talk about the five civilized tribes of the south and their ultimate removal to the west. So when we say the five civilized tribes, first of all, that expression didn't come into usage until after the Civil War. Um, and we're talking about, sometimes they're just called the five tribes. We're talking about Cherokees, Choctaws, Creeks, or Muscogee, Chickasaws, and Seminoles. If they had spelled Seminole with a C, they would have had a, a C thing uh, going there all the way through. So this map <clears throat> shows where the, uh, the territories, the traditional territories, homelands, of those five tribes were uh, at, their, at their peak. Like the Cherokees, uh, for example, expanded quite a bit, actually in the early 1700s. So this was, uh, this was their peak. Um, you can see that the Creek Territory spans uh, much of uh, Georgia and Alabama, except the northernmost part, and down into North Florida. Uh, the Cherokees, uh, right there in that spot that uh, is the convergence of several states, Western North Carolina, um, South Carolina, Northern Georgia and Alabama, much of Tennessee and uh, parts of Western Virginia and uh, Kentucky, although Cherokees didn't live in Kentucky. Uh, that was an area that they controlled and hunted in. All right. Well, as we have discussed, after 1794, the, uh, the, the tribes, for the most part, for the most part, the five tribes and other tribes in the South, uh, came to the uh, realization they could not militarily defeat the United States, and so they took a different tack. Uh, they started uh, um, adapting uh, and using some of the methods and tools of white people or non-Indians uh, to try to preserve their sovereignty and their homeland. You know, things like... Um, like education and literacy and written laws and law enforcement and uh, changes in trade, things like that. So that uh, over the course of a couple of generations from the late 1700s until the, uh, by, by the time of the 1720s, 1730s, Cherokees had moved from living in traditional Cherokee homes uh, that were uh, sort of mud and earth to living in cabins to some of them uh, having achieved financial success living even in in plantation manors in mansions like uh, like this one in northern Georgia the van house uh, moving up from the van cabin well uh, I think we've talked a little bit about how Georgia in particular wanted to get rid of their Indians. And as early as 1802, President Thomas Jefferson had promised to help them do so in return for Georgia giving over to the federal government their land claims west of the Appalachian Mountains. But his, his way of doing it was very, very slow and gradual, which is not what the, uh, the citizens of Georgia wanted. Well, 1828, something very significant happens in northern Georgia. Gold is discovered. And uh, most of it is on Cherokee land. Now, you know what happens when gold gets discovered. People come from all over to try to strike it rich. Uh, a gold strike. This was the first one, the first big gold rush in American history. It would be overshadowed a little over 20 years later by the one in California. But this one was pretty big. So all these people come pouring in to Cherokee land, which leads Georgia uh, to begin pushing even harder for the Cherokees to be removed. They also wanted the Creeks removed. Bear in mind, a big part of the reason for them wanting the Indians removed from the South, especially the Deep South, was so that uh, the citizens of the U.S., of those Southern states, would have access to Indian lands to grow cotton. Well, Andrew Jackson was very much in favor of the idea of Indian removal. Um, he himself 
had applied pressure to the Chickasaw Nation in uh, 1818, 1819, after the end of the uh, Seminole War, first the Creek War, then the first Seminole War. He had applied pressure to get the Chickasaws to sign over all their lands on the uh, um, the banks on the uh, the eastern bank of of the Mississippi River, and that's where. Uh, Jackson and his colleagues established the city of Memphis. Uh, Jackson also, by the way, had close associates who were in the uh, real estate business who made a fortune when Jackson essentially seized the land of the Creek Indians after the Creek War, even those Creeks who had been on his side. So he's very much in favor of moving uh, the Indians west of the Mississippi. And that had been one of his campaign promises when he ran for president. First in 1824, when he was narrowly defeated by the uh, um, Secretary of State at that time, John Quincy Adams, who went on to become president. Then in 1828, when Jackson came back and unseated John Quincy Adams. So that was one of his big promises, to remove the Indians. Why? What was his reason for for doing that. Well, for their own good, which is exactly what Thomas Jefferson had said when he proposed the idea. But one, reading reading Jefferson's writings about Indians, one suspects he, he may have actually believed that to some degree. Uh, Jackson, it's not so certain. Now, Jackson made comments, people all throughout the South made comments about how the Indians needed to be removed because they were savages, they were violent, they were incapable of being civilized, uh, they, were, uh, uh, they were noble savages, but savages nonetheless, and must be removed before the face of progress. Now, I would point out, we just took a look at that mansion that the Van family owned, and they were not the only ones. Uh, some of... Uh, some of these uh, families of the five tribes had been quite successful. Bear in mind that uh, part of the strategy of the five tribes was to marry their daughters to, uh, to white merchants and, and businessmen who would bring those uh, individuals into the orbit of the tribes so that their children, who were tribal members, would inherit their property some other examples going on in the Cherokee Nation of, uh, well, some examples that disproved those accusations of the white Southerners that the, the Indians were incapable of advancing to the level of white people were these two individuals, Sequoia on the left and Elias Boudinot, on the right. Now it looks like if you speak French that that should be Elias Boudinot. Uh, he and his family pronounced it Boudinot. He named himself uh, after Elias Boudinot, who was a, uh, a politician, one of the founding fathers actually, who had helped him significantly early in life. And so he changed his name to, to that to honor him. Anyway, um, Sequoia, I bet you've heard of. Uh, Sequoia, who was born in the uh, Cherokee village of Tuskegee, uh, which is right across, uh, right across from Fort Loudoun, um, had never, well, he was, he, was, uh, he was Cherokee. He had supported the uh, Chickamauga uh, resistance, although I don't know that he actually uh, fought. Um, he came up. He, he came up with the idea of developing a written language for the Cherokees. Now he didn't speak English, but he took note of the fact that the Americans had talking leaves, pages, uh, through which they were able to achieve power, and he thought the Cherokees should do the same thing. So he created the Cherokee syllabary, which is like an alphabet, but not exactly the same thing, because in an alphabet, each letter stands for a different, uh, different sound. In a syllabary, each letter stands for a potential 
syllable, a potential combination of a consonant and a vowel. I worked on it for years, finished it in 1821. Um, if you've seen the Cherokee language, you'll notice it looks kind of like um, the, the, the letters that we're used to, but not exactly. That's because he used some of those as a guide, but attached totally different sounds to them. Now, Sequoia was supported in this by the tribal government of the Cherokees and by the Cherokee principal chief. Um, and eventually, once his uh, syllabary was introduced and Cherokee started learning to use it, the literacy level of the Cherokees became significantly higher than the literacy level of the white Americans living around them in Georgia, North Carolina, and so forth. Now, Elias Boudinot, whose name was actually uh, uh, Buck Waddy, um, was uh, one of one of several students, Cherokee students, who were very promising, uh, that were taught in the missionary schools. And so the tribe took some of their money and sent him to college. Uh, they sent him uh, up north uh, to what is now Dartmouth University, uh, where he got, uh, got an education, came back to the Cherokee Nation, and... Um, became the editor of the first Cherokee newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, again sponsored by the tribal government, sponsored by Principal Chief John Ross, who was a fairly young man at that time himself. So the, uh, uh, the, the Phoenix, the Cherokee Phoenix, was uh, the way it was presented is that each page on one side, in one column, one half of the, the page, was written in English, and the other uh, was written in the Cherokee language using the Cherokee syllabary. Now, my point here is, developing a whole new written language and following that up with a newspaper seems like the sort of thing that would indicate the capability of being civilized, doesn't it? Well, it does unless you're living next to them and you want their land and you want an excuse to take it away from them. Let's take a look at uh, the excuse or the reasoning used by Andrew Jackson to uh, promote the removal of the Indians. Got a, a lengthy quote from him here from 1829, which is uh, the year he took office and the year that he started pushing through the Indian Removal Act that eventually was passed by Congress uh, wasn't passed by a large margin, especially in the House. Uh, he said, speaking about the Indians, Our conduct toward these people is deeply interesting to our national character. Their present condition, contrasted with what they once were, makes a most powerful appeal to our sympathies. Our ancestors found them the uncontrolled possessors of these vast regions. By persuasion and force, they've been made to retire from river to river and from mountain to mountain until some of the tribes have become extinct and others have left but remnants to preserve for a while their once terrible names. Surrounded by the whites with their arts of civilization, which by destroying the resources of the savage doom him to weakness and decay, the fate of the Mohegan, the Narragansett, and the Delaware, those New England tribes, is fast overtaking the Choctaw, the Cherokee, and the Creek, that this fate surely awaits them if they remain within the limits of the states, does not admit of a doubt. Humanity and a national honor demand that every effort should be made to avert so great a calamity. So all those New England tribes, he's saying, pretty much disappeared. They were pretty much wiped out or absorbed. That was their fate, and it is now becoming the fate of the Cherokees, Choctaws, Creeks, and etc., because they cannot stand against the advancing progress of white civilization. There's no way they can do it, uh, because they're savages and they're doomed. 
And so they're going to be wiped out unless we do something to help them, these poor people. We have to, our honor demands that we avert the calamity of their, of their suffering and disappearance by moving them somewhere else. He also said uh, the following year, Toward the aborigines of the country, no one can indulge a more friendly feeling than myself or would go further in attempting to reclaim them from their wandering habits and to make them a happy, prosperous people. Wandering habits. The Cherokees didn't have wandering habits, and they never had, nor had any of these tribes. These were not nomadic tribes. They'd always had towns. They'd always had agriculture. And they were, at the time this was being written, being said, a pretty happy, prosperous people. Um, as demonstrated, again, uh, by houses like that of, uh, of James Van in northern Georgia. Well, the, uh, the Indian Removal Act was passed, and what it entailed was essentially requiring the tribes to sign over their land east of the Mississippi and accept in return for that land west of the Mississippi where they would be removed by the government. Now, for about 15 years, the government had been doing this on a voluntary basis, trying to get uh, tribes, and they never got a whole tribe, but trying to get bands and individuals uh, to, to take this deal to give up their land uh, in the east and accept land in the west. And a handful had taken uh, advantage of that offer in the 18-teens and into the early 1820s, but the vast majority had not. Now, each tribe, essentially, had two factions. Each tribe had one faction that viewed themselves as pragmatic, that argued there's no way they can keep their land, that the U.S. government is going to win, and that if they're forced, if the U.S. government is forced to remove them physically, they will not get as good a deal as they're being offered now. So it's best just to go ahead and take the deal. Uh, so there was that, that side. That side was the minority in each tribe. The other faction in each tribe was often the more traditionalists, the ones who had not adapted, the ones who were not overwhelmingly uh, biracial offspring of, of uh, white fathers uh, and owners of a lot of property, but were more traditionalists who wanted to stay in their homeland and live the way they had always lived and were not willing to sign that land over under any circumstances. And these two factions would have tension in every tribe. So let's look at the Creeks first. In 1821, the Creek National Council declared the death penalty for any Creek Indian who sold land without the approval of the tribe at large. Cherokees passed a similar law, by the way. Uh, so that's, that's considered treason. Remember, these are tribal governments and communal uh, groups so that the council, the council controlled uh, the, the, the land, not individuals. The community, uh, in essence, did. In February of 1825, a Creek leader uh, who was uh, uh, biracial, came from on his father's side, Scottish, William McIntosh and several others signed a treaty, Treaty of Indian Springs, giving all Creek land in Georgia away and half the Creek land in Alabama that was left. Jackson had taken quite a bit. Gave it all away for $200,000 to be given to the tribe but uh, the, uh, the accusation was that some of the people who signed this treaty got a significant amount of that. 
and were offered the, the best land west of the Mississippi. Uh, this, uh, this, was, this was opposed by Creek leaders like Apotheleahola, a traditionalist. That's Apotheleahola on the right. That's William McIntosh on the left. Um, the argument was that McIntosh and the others who signed this treaty were not, none of them was the principal chief of the Creek people. They did not represent the will of the people. They did not represent the tribal council. Uh, but the U.S. government took their signatures. Well, um, as a result of McIntosh signing this treaty, he was executed. Now, it depends on your point of view. Some people would say that he was murdered because a group of uh, Red Stick Creeks, traditionalists, led by a guy named Manawa, some people say Apotheliahola was in the group, attacked McIntosh at his home and killed him. So the, from the point of view of the uh, traditionalists, that was a legal execution because he had broken uh, a, uh, a law that had the death penalty attached. Now, the next year, 1826, Congress reversed the treaty because they had been convinced by Apotheliahola and others that uh, McIntosh had not had the right and the others to sign the treaty. So they let they gave them back the land in Alabama, but they kept, the U.S. kept all the land in Georgia. So there, Georgia has solved half their Indian problem. Now, after the passage of the Indian Removal Act in 1830, uh, the, the Creeks, well, at, at first, some of them started to take the deal, um, sort of voluntarily. Families, sometimes small bands, started moving out west into what is now Oklahoma. Um, but not all of them. Quite a few remained, and there was more pressure for them to leave, and they were... Uh, well, they were facing things like randomly being murdered by settlers, for one thing. Uh, that led in 1836 to a short war between the Creeks and the U.S., which was the justification, all the justification needed to forcibly remove all of them. Uh, so they were loaded up onto steamboats and uh, then taken to New Orleans and from there up into Oklahoma. Others of them were forced to march uh, to Oklahoma in 1836. The Choctaws, let's take a look at them. Uh, the Choctaws were a uh, tripartite governmental structure. There were three divisions and three chiefs who were equal in power. Now that changed shortly after this to a structure with an executive branch and a single executive to be called the principal chief. But at this time, the tradition had been for centuries, three groups, three chiefs. Greenwood LaFleur, he's the guy on the left right there. Uh, Greenwood LaFleur was one of those three chiefs. He was, uh, well, he was the, uh, the son of a Choctaw mother and a French father, a French merchant trader. Uh, his mother was the daughter of Pushmataha, who was uh, the most influential of all Choctaw leaders. Uh, Lafleur was um, a modernist, not a traditionalist. So when the federal government asked to meet with the three leaders at a place called Dancing Rabbit Creek, um, he came along, uh, Greenwood Lafleur, um, also present uh, were uh, a couple of uh, a couple of others, including a guy on the far right there, Mashala Tubby. A uh, guy in the middle, uh, Snapping Turtle alias Peter Pitchlin, was not one of the three chiefs, but I put him up there because he became the principal chief of the whole nation. Uh, he and Mashala Tubby both opposed to removal. In fact, two of the three chiefs were opposed to removal. LaFleur was in favor of it. Let's take the deal, essentially, he said. Now, the meeting with the U.S. government and those three chiefs was almost symbolic of what was going on. The fact that Choctaw culture was in flux 
is you got three guys. You got Greenwood LaFleur in a business suit. You've got uh, one of the other leaders um, who is dressed in traditional garb, like Peter Pitchlin is there. And then you've got Marshall Tubby, who showed up in the U.S. Army uniform Andrew Jackson had given him during the Creek War, uh, when the Choctaws and Cherokees had sided with the U.S. against the Red Stick Creek. So that's like uh, a culture in transition, right? Um, the majority didn't want to sign this treaty and give over their land. However, when everybody else went home, the floor stuck, stuck around. And then the government uh, agents came back and said, okay, one more chance. Do you want to sign the treaty? And so a vote was taken of LaFleur's followers, who were basically the only ones still there. And then uh, LaFleur signed the treaty, which the U.S. government used as the, uh, the means by which to require the Choctaws to give up their land and leave. Um, LaFleur did not leave. He stayed uh, in Mississippi and accepted Mississippi citizenship and later became uh, a state legislator in Mississippi. If you go to Mississippi, you find things named after Greenwood LaFleur all over the place. Go to Oklahoma and you don't. All right, so that was the, uh, the Choctaws. Uh, same situation as the Creeks. There was some division. Didn't lead to the type of violence it had with the Creeks. All right, uh, we're going to talk about the Cherokees in a moment, uh, so far as the divisions there. Uh, but first, we're going to talk about this guy, John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and three very important Supreme Court decisions. <laughs> 